everybody, and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to do another basing video, and it's time for some industrial waste bases. So, let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V style. Penny here is a big fan of industrial waste basing in general, so she's going to help me out with this tutorial. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to start off by grabbing a bunch of random bits, materials, and just things that are interesting. Uh, my key with basing is always a sort of nose-to-tail philosophy. We're going to use everything we can. Not your nose-to-tail, don't worry. You're, you're fine. Uh, and instead, we're going to try to throw it all together and make a jumbled mess of a base. And the reason for that is because when we have this sort of industrial landscape, this wrecked wasteland of something that used to be civilization, we want there to be layer upon layer of stuff. Things that have existed, these creations of man that aren't nature itself. And they all just sit on top of each other. So, what do you think? She agrees. Hey, let's make ourselves a fun industrial waste base. First off, I've got these little bits, these little floor panels from some kind of GW terrain. I've got a bag of sandbags, always useful uh, because people lived here and might have used it. Various cogs and gears. You can buy these in bulk from eBay and Amazon and places. Uh, we've got the little tip protectors for your paintbrushes. Always save those. Those are perfect in-scale pipes. Uh, this is some random circuit board guts from inside some piece of technology that died and I broke apart, as well as an old phone cable. Uh, not really going to be using that anymore to do any dial-up 56k modem action, but the cable is good because I can strip it and take out the tiny cables and use them as in-scale uh, cable pieces. And of course, we've also got some rocks of various size, uh, as well as things like sand and grit and stuff like that. So, I don't know what all we're going to use. But let's start by making ourselves some more vertical space to mess around with here. Uh, so we're just gonna take some cork and, uh, and chop it up. Now, we don't actually want to let the cork really show anywhere. We're gonna be covering most of this up, uh, but it's just there to give us some height, um, some verticality. Then I start chopping up these pieces. Uh, it won't matter if the edges look a little rough because they're gonna be end up having dirt on them and rusted and stippled and other crap laying over the top of them. So we're just trying to break up the shapes, make them a little less uh, regular and see how they, they fit on there. This figure happens to be, that, that we'll probably end up putting on here, happens to be like leaping forward. So I'm actually doing this a part of an angle. Normally I'd be trying to make a flat space for the figure to stand, but this figure is in a sort of forward motion. Uh, so I just kind of cut these into place until I find a way that they all kind of sit together that I think looks cool and and will give us something to play with. Uh, then we start playing around with the little gears. This is just more or less for like industrial waste or, or something like that. Uh, you know, machinery. Obviously these are tiny little watch gears. Like I said, I just bought these all, you know, in bulk, various sizes off of uh, eBay. but. You can also uh, find all sorts of things made for craft kits and stuff like that. Uh, you know, little tiny jewelers and doll house pieces and things like that actually do work great because they're sort of meant to be in scale automatically to, to what we're doing. And how big is a gear? Well, I mean, if it's on an industrial machine, it could be truly massive, right? So that's one of the fun things about this is they make gears that fit in your watch and gears that fit on giant machines. And they're they're all basically the same exact shape and construction. So you can be a little creative with it. But I'm just trying to shove these things in at weird angles. Part of the key here is to make sure that all of this stuff lays on top of each other. It has to build up and feel as though uh, this was some kind of construction, something that existed in the world where you had you know, ground and earth and floor and pipes and wires and, you know, stuff sitting in the the building that collapsed or whatever, right? It's society, civilization builds things in layers. And so when all of that breaks apart and you get this, you know, heavy industrial sort of wasteland type of vibe, you want that to all be broken up and, and mixed in with each other. So I'm trying to make sure that there are pipes coming out the, the sort of front and the back. Uh, that, that, that might have at one time, you know, been heating pipes or, or something like that, or coolant pipes. Uh, maybe it was warm, maybe it was cold. Who knows? Only Katy Perry. 
but then stuff like this, this nice little piece broken off of the circuit board. What a great looking weird industrial thing this is. Like scaled up some kind of maybe turbine or something. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, but this is the next thing. You can just play around with it. Kind of move the pieces around as you get them. You'll see I'm often test fitting things. I'm not sure exactly where I want the thing to go. Just kind of play with multiple places. There's actually quite a lot of room when you're building up like this to pack this stuff in together. And so you can just really see, hey, what looks cool? Try it in different positions, different angles. Uh, with my telephone cable here, I just strip the, the rubber off and then get the two smaller cables from underneath. And then bing, bang, we've got some awesome uh, cabling that we can run around. This is actually a great trick if you ever want to add cables to your, your robots or your miniatures or to terrain. Uh, so if you've got like a, let's say an MDF building and you want to make it look more realistic, adding, you know, this kind of small cabling to the side of the building, which is pretty easy if you just, you know, find an old cable or old piece of technology around your house, strip it out and then take out the cables and you're good to go. You can get tons and tons of feet of cables, way more than you'll ever use on most modeling projects. And once you kind of have it bent to shape, we just kind of glue it in. Uh, we're also going to go ahead and lock in that like a little sandbag here. Uh, you know, something that's just, again, interesting. Maybe it wasn't a military sandbag, but maybe it was uh, something that was like a weight uh, for something on the floor here uh, when this was actually a physical place. Just more things to break up the space. Once I'm happy with all my accoutrement, it's time to start adding sort of rocks and things like that. So I'm just spreading around this heavy grit first. I always start with the heavier rocks uh, just to get them in there and kind of base down. Uh, and then using a, a brush that I am going to absolutely, that I just throw away after I'm done here, I spread some super glue uh, and around on the various parts. And then that's where I put on my sand and dirt and stuff like that. So you wanna make sure all that's filled in, all that has texture, uh, you know, to cover up the base. Once it's all primed, as you can see, it comes right together. So now let's paint this bad boy. Uh, industrial stuff is obviously going to have a lot of metal, which is great because it gives us a chance to do a bunch of heavy weathering and means we can just make this a fun, relaxing paint project. Uh, so we're just starting with, of course, laying down some of uh, some Vallejo metal color steel, just turning all the stuff metal that I want to be metal. No, no big deal there. Once I've got everything I want metal, I then get some copper in the mix because we want different types of metals in here. We're going to weather these both differently and chop them up. And the whole thing's going to be pretty grungy and grimy because I'm assuming this is all giant collapsed infrastructure. So it would be quite dirty and rusted and burned out. So we, we, we can totally bring in that grim, dark vibe pretty hard as we go on. But first we got to establish some base tones. Now, when it comes to the earth, I'm not going to focus too hard on trying to get a good blend at this point, but I just use the two different colors of brown, one very light, one very dark, and I just start mixing different amounts of it and wet blending it up using the lighter color earth up top and the higher parts of the dirt using the darker mix at the bottom. Just moving around swiftly, wet blending to my heart's content, just turning things brown. The individual colored elements like the cable, I'm gonna go ahead and hit now because I want that to be weathered over the top. That is to say, I wanna uh, you know, have this cable look like it's also muddy, dirty, filthy stuff uh, once I put on all of my, my grime. Speaking of grime, oh, my new favorite, rattling grime. I love this stuff. It it's, doesn't dry super dark. It goes on super dark, but it doesn't dry super dark. Uh, but like when you, when you put it on between its application and its actual complete dried, boy, is there a difference. But that being said, we're gonna, we're gonna invoke and channel our best Richard Gray impression here because I wipe off my brush and then go straight into contrast medium and just start swooshing it all around. And I am just gonna flood, gonna slather this miniature like a barbecue wing uh, with contrast medium, just to make sure that all that rattling grime is running down in the recesses, getting nice and, and, and dark down in those areas, really seeping in. I don't want it sitting on anything. Uh, and then I just start subtracting it off. So I start wiping it. Once I get it all spread around, I then just start wiping it off the flat areas on my paper towel. And you can see it gives us a really nice patina, but still collects all that darkness down in the lower areas. 
Um, with that done, we just apply a little dry brush uh, of sorts to the cork. We want to pop out some of that metal, show some places where there's scratches and scratches. Even though it's old metal, if somebody's literally walking across it, because there's going to be feet on it, there will be places where the edge still glints, uh, or where there'd still be some kind of light and stipple and scratches of the of the fresh steel. So we just kind of put that all over the place to uh, to to create that that vibe. Uh, I probably should have stopped this before uh, I kept going, but hey, whatever. There you can see how much I actually did. Then we get out some Garagax Sewer, uh, my other favorite new contrast paint, and we're just going to tint a bunch of stuff rusty, give it that oxidized patina over all, well not all, but over a lot of that steel. One of the keys with these is as you paint it, don't worry if you make mistakes. Just let it roll off you, like water off of maybe a dog's back. Don't worry about the fact that you're, you might make some paint mistakes or stuff like that. As you continue on, you can weather, you can rust, you can vertigree, you can add more dust, you can do, you can throw pigment on top, you can do whatever. The point is there's always another step, there's always another layer, there's always another chance to correct your mistake. So, let's keep painting. All right, so with that done, then it's time to apply the heavier rust. So this is Vallejo Dry Rust, which is a, actually has texture in it. You can just mix some dark paint with uh, dark pigment if you want to make your own at home. But here I'm just using the actual product just to reinforce some of that darker rust in there and really get some of those spaces real grungy and grimy. Uh, and of course, I want to show some fresh rust, but I want to... Uh, I want there to be a general patina of the orange before I get in and do the like little stipples and spots. So we're going to use some contrast magma droth flame, which is a wonderful orange for uh, doing older rust. It looks again really super bright when you first put it on, but when it dries on the darkened brown, it's not very strong at all. This was something new I wanted to try, which is taking the Green Stuff World Fluorescent Orange Pigment, which is really bright, and mixing it in with the contrast to see if I could get a, a nice rust effect with some actual texture. And sure enough, it did exactly what I hoped it would do. So I'm going to experiment with this more in the future. But mixing in that super bright fluorescent pigment with the, uh, with the actual contrast paint produced a pretty cool result. So more on that in the future. Uh, getting in some Nurgle's Rot to show some leaky pipes where whatever coolant or uh, stuff was in there. Again, just trying to layer uh, all these things on top of each other. And I've popped up some really bright colors here at the end. We've got some verdigris on the copper. We've got this bright orange. We've got this green. Nothing too unbelievably strong. Nothing too saturated. But I want there to be some visual interest, some color in the space. I don't want it to all just be grungy brown. I do still want it to have some visual appeal. But if you ever go too far or knock your colors up too high and you do want it to look weaker, a little bit of Agrax or a shade at the end can just take everything right back down and smooth it out. And so here what I'm doing is a more controlled application to just create shadows uh, and, and tone back some of those colors because I want it to be punchy, but not all the way. And then that last step, that sweet, 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 Abaddon black base rim. Mm -mm. It's a good time even when you're just painting the base. All right, there we go. The base is all done. Now we've got to find a figure to put on top of this, so we'll see what we can do for that for the future. But for now, we have a nice base to set for an industrial wasteland that's been wrecked and ruined. It was a lot of fun to make this. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, we have an entire uh, playlist dedicated to different basing schemes, so if this one isn't for you, there's probably something in there that is. Uh, if you liked this, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos every Saturday. If you want to continue on your hobby journey, don't forget there's a Patreon down below uh, focused on review and feedback and taking your next step in your own personal hobby journey. Uh, but of course, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.